It is good to be here in worship. It is good to be a family together. We have lots of stuff going on in the life of our church. We do have, I am Pastor Leanne, for you at home, welcome to church. We are glad that you are here. Do you ever watch other churches? I always get a little fussy when they don't welcome people at home. They only talk in house. So we talk to you too. So uh, it is good to be together. Uh, and with that, let us, we are welcoming new members today. So let me invite Carolyn and Suzanne to come on down front. And those who are joining us in membership, come on down front. And Suzanne and Carolyn, who am I handing the microphone to? Our first person joining will be Rita Hall. Read a wall. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> and Kimberly Fraker. And over there with that cute little baby is Elise Dunavit uh, Jones. Very nice. So these are our folks who are joining our church. We are glad to have them. Let me invite you. You will remember how to do this, I am sure. Grab your hymnals. Hymnal, it's the bigger red book in your pew. And turn to page 38. Okay, friends who are joining, your answer is I will. I, I'm just, if you, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's fun to do things out of the hymnal. Okay. Friends who are joining, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? If so, please say, I will. I will. And family of Christ, our church, uh, I am on number 16 on the left side of the page, so number, page 38. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in peace. We welcome you to this body of the United Methodist Church. Welcome, friends. And Carolyn and I hope that you'll take a moment and greet everyone in the Narthex before you leave today. And we are thrilled that you are here with us. Thank you so very much for joining our church. Glad to have you. Kimberly, I'm glad you're here today. Nice to see you. Yeah, go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, Suzanne and Carolyn. Thank you both. Oh, so cute. Let me invite our Dakota to come on down front to lead us in our opening prayer. Congregation, let me invite you to stand as you are able in body or spirit that we may pray as we begin our time of formal worship. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And welcome to all of you joining us on this beautiful Sunday. Today is the second Sunday of Lent, and we invite you to join us as we continue our walk together with Jesus. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? O oh, divine companion, be our holy guest during this time of worship. Reveal the depths of your love to our hearts and show us the path of hope. Give us a taste of living water in the midst of our dryness. O oh, loving God, be our holy guest and redeem this time. We invite you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And please remain standing. We're going to sing, Come Now is the Time to Worship. Now is the time 
to worship God. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship God. Just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship God. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to privilege to hear from Reverend Dr. Kimberly Rossaw, uh, an Old Testament professor from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. She preached on the journey of Ruth and uh, what a journey Ruth did take. Uh, Ruth traveled with her bitter traveling companion, her mother-in-law, and on the way back to her mother-in-law's homeland, Ruth didn't get a single solitary conversation in with that mother-in-law who was bitter. So Ruth does not have an easy go of the journey that she was on, and Reverend Dr. Kimberly reminded us of that. She also reminded us of the troubling texts that are in scriptures during our Bible study that she shared with us on Tuesday. Um, for an Old Testament professor, they know all too well the troubling texts that we face, the unresolved questions of the Bible, and the places where we are just reticent to go in the church. Troubling texts is some of what professors and faithful call places in the Bible where bad things happen to good people, or just a people, or things happen that don't seem just or make sense. There's a lot of that, actually, in the Bible. I lift this up because it is a good thing to remember during Lent. It is a good thing to remember that not everything in our Christian faith is tied up in a nice, neat, pretty bow. Disney does not have a song for everything that goes on to make everything better in our faith. Lent works on the trouble that Jesus faces and invites us into that journey. So today's scriptures, today's scriptures that you will hear read are from the very first book that is in our scriptures from Genesis and from Mark's gospel. Both of these scriptures are big worldview kind of scriptures. Uh, in Genesis, Abram, uh, Abram is going Abram is going to be the ancestor, the father of all the nations. It is a very big thing that God comes and speaks to Abram. And in Mark's gospel, 
Jesus is sharing about he's going to suffer and die. Both of these texts are very large, epic stories, epic information for us to take in. Whole world kind of scriptures, launching our faith beyond one moment, one time, one place, and certainly beyond what is just easy to understand. Part of listening to our scriptures is being open to, what do I not know? What is God saying to me that I might not have heard before? The God of the universe cannot be contained in a small story, one event, or a single perspective. That will be our takeaway today. So don't get too comfortable, and yet, trust God. Listen now to these two passages, and we will talk about it on the other side. Good morning. I've never stood up here before. <laughs> the scriptures today are from Genesis and Mark, and I will be reading both passages from the new revised standard version of the Bible. <laughs> when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. And then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And now the reading from Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, and he be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain for the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of then the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Was it just me or was the get behind me Satan part just a little bit more pronounced with that reading today? Did you hear it? Nice job, Alvin. It is uh, a blessing to be able to hear uh, our scriptures read uh, in others' voices over time. I think it gives us a different perspective, a new perspective, and a nuance of the scriptures in and of itself, the listening to the Word of God. So in one of his classic teachings, the Buddha tells his disciples that understanding his instruction is like picking up a poisonous snake in the wild. It is easy to get bitten. The Buddha teaches it is entirely possible to misinterpret his teachings and infer or understand or hear 
the exact opposite of what the Buddha intends. Not 10 or 20 degrees off, but 180 degrees different than what he means with what he is teaching. He says to his disciples, think of it this way. If you pick up a snake, that poisonous snake, in the middle of its body, it can easily turn around and bite you. But if you manage and do the work and get right behind its head, right behind its jaw, and pick it up there, you're going to be safe and sound. I don't, I don't want to pick up a snake no matter what, but it is an interesting point to, to hear. The Buddha says in the same way, it's not just a matter of hearing, teaching, and reciting it, but holding it, listening to it in the right way that is life-giving. To shift the metaphor a little bit, a scalpel, a scalpel can be used to save a life or to an end a life. Powerful ideas, ideas can do the same. They can wound or they can heal. How is it that we listen, learn, and hold our faith, particularly during Lent on the way to the cross? We live with troubling texts. We live with challenging messages in the Bible that Jesus teaches us. And part of our goal, responsibility, maturing in faithfulness is learning how to grab hold and listen to our faith with our life. One of our denominational ethics uh, that comes to us from our United Methodist heritage and tradition is reading our scriptures, how we read our scriptures, not just as individuals. We don't just sit uh, in a room by ourselves, read it out loud, say amen, and move on. But we read our scriptures as a body of people who listen, discern, and generation by generation learn from scholars and gain new information from people who are doing study in the field. For instance, the King James Version of the Bible was gathered and worked on by 27 scholars, all men, not, not a problem with that, but all men, sponsored by a king or the head of the state and published in 1611. It was a few years ago. At that time, Greek codices and Hellenistic papyra were, which clarified common Greek dialects, had not yet been discovered. They didn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Bible is a collection of materials gathered over time, written, copied by hand for many generations, over and over by different people, translated from ancient languages to modern languages, from Greek and Hebrew to English and more. As United Methodists, we read the Bible through contemporary scholarship and study, not just the stirring of our heart. When we pick up these teachings, we do so with curiosity and with humility. Many pastors, many colleagues of mine use many different versions of the Bible. The New Revised Standard Version, the King James Version, the New International Version, the Message. All of these listening to what is God's word, listening for the nuances of our faith, listening even for the troubles and the laments within God's word. So let's back up a couple verses in Mark's passage today. Mark's passage today, he's going to suffer. We'll get to that in a minute. But just preceding that warning from Jesus, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that he is? Who do people say that I am? Of course, all the disciples get it wrong except for Peter. Peter answers when Jesus asks, you are the Messiah. Peter gets it right. And then Jesus directs him and all the disciples, don't tell anybody. That in and of itself is a little bit of a problem for us all. Why did he say that? 
is it from this, it is from this don't tell anyone passage that Jesus moves on to this information that he's going to suffer and he's going to die. It is the teaching. Jesus is going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's going to rise again. And anyone who wants to be on the Jesus team must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow. Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and if you want to be with me, you need to pick up your cross and follow. The disciples hearing this are perplexed. Of course they are. Peter is offended, my word. Peter is even, I think, kind of outraged. Peter takes Jesus aside. Jesus, Jesus, come over here. I can hear Peter with my heart. I bet you can too. Um, Jesus, I just heard you, I think, and you are wrong. You can't suffer and die. We need you. You're Jesus. You have power. You have authority. You're the Son of God. I, I really relate to Peter here. I think many of us would do the same. No, no, Jesus. This is not the way it has to be. Jesus, though, turning from Peter back to the rest of the disciples, makes Peter an example. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter, throughout his discipleship in the scriptures, does feel a little bit of a clumsy disciple at points. But I don't think he deserved this. It feels a little like an overreaction from Jesus, maybe. Um, this road to do God's work, to stand up for justice, for humanity, for goodness. Jesus is clear that it is going to involve suffering and even death. And I think this is the point that Jesus is making. He is trying to drive this home with the disciples. Doing this work and following God, lifting up God's justice, God's word, going against the government of the day, caring for the people who are poor and and most in need is going to, to result in causing ire from others who are in power. This faithfulness to God, this commitment to service, it is not an easy journey, Jesus is saying. We're going to suffer because of it. So I don't really blame Peter here for trying to say something to Jesus. No, don't do that. It is troubling. But Jesus needs us to understand the disciples then and us now. Jesus needs us to understand the season of the cross and the empty tomb and the call that is upon our lives and the way we are meant to be in this world. He needs us to pick up this story, this teaching, this message the right way, the life-giving way, so that we receive life, not destruction. Jesus goes on in this passage to say, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? It is... This is the teaching of suffering and sacrifice to all who follow and pick up the cross. How is it that we pick up the cross and set our mind on divine things and life-saving things? I just finished watching the series The Crown. Uh, if, you, if you've come to uh, worship for a while, you know that I just started binge-watching it a few weeks ago, right? Um, so I just got to the end of the series. What an amazing series. Um, I was absolutely focused, completely enthralled, and truthfully, the ending of it snuck up on me a little bit. I just kept hitting go to the next thing and didn't realize I was all the way at the end. The final episode was beautiful, and I just wasn't ready for it to be over. Um, 
I suppose I should tell you if you want to leave and you, you haven't gotten to the end or you intend to watch it, you might want to step out, right? I don't think these are too many spoiler alerts, but nonetheless. Throughout the series, I was touched by having different actors play several people over the season. There were six seasons, and so they had young, uh, middle-aged, and, and older actors play a couple of different characters, including Queen Elizabeth II. Um, with the last episode, Elizabeth is facing the end of her life, and she is confronted by uh, making her memorial plans. Uh, with all the protocol and the procedures for a funeral and the succession of power, um, all of that is called, we learned, Operation London Bridge. And in the course of summing up her life, the queen, Elizabeth, talks to her younger self, played by the other two actresses who had played her during the series. So it was a beautiful, uh, it was a beautiful thing on the screen to have the, all three of them in this, this um, frame together, kind of having a conversation, if you will. There were several scenes, even so, and in addition, where Queen Elizabeth is talking to those who preceded her in death, her sister, um, others. As she talks to herself, though, I was compelled. Um, she has a conversation or a pondering or a reflection on the self that she let go of by choosing to fully embrace being queen. She talked to herself um, about the self that she allowed to die, that this person might live. How is it that we let go of part of ourselves to move forward with who we are choosing to be? She reflects on the ways in which she is a unique person and even a dying breed of leaders um, and how she denied parts of herself. With the conclusion of the series, we don't see uh, her memorial service, but we do see this beautiful framing of this long walk of Elizabeth through a very long cathedral. Um, and in this long walk that took a minute to unfold, you saw this person walking out towards the end of the cathedral and in the walk getting smaller and smaller and smaller and lighter and lighter and lighter as if she is being moved from life into history, a passing into the ages. Now, I don't share all of this to suggest anything about the monarch Elizabeth. You will have your own thoughts and opinions about that system of governance. But I was touched by the way the show portrayed the impact of life over a long time with decisions and connections and the ways in which we make choices about who we are, dying to some possibilities of our life to live to other ones the way we die to oneself to live to another part or another role in life. I inferred from some of what they said that Elizabeth let part of herself uh, that had a glorious sense of humor and was funny and shy die or pass away that she may have this um, staunchness and leadership in a public way. Jesus teaching. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Our faith journey, this journey that we move through, as we pick up troubling texts, troubling scriptures, and this week, and during Lent, as we pick up this troubling message from Jesus about the suffering that we go through as people of faith, and him in a very particular way, we pick up this scripture and this message with gentle tenderness, receiving a message of dying to the self of this world that we might live to the self of faith and sacrifice and compassion towards others. We die to that which is self-centered, and we live to that which is pointed toward justice, neighborly kindness, and love. 
The Genesis passage with Abram moving to Abraham, receiving a message from God about this really long view, a long connection with family and heritage we have in faith. It is an even longer view than Elizabeth as monarch. God is literally offering Abram this really long, epic connection with all of human history over the long time. It is powerful what we get from this Genesis passage, this connection of relationships. The Bible covers hundreds of years, thousands of years of human relationships to land us in this place, in Vista, California, here today. Our scriptures have been touched literally by many hands and hearts over many seasons of existence. To deny the troubling parts of scripture, to deny the suffering of Jesus' experience, to deny ourselves is to set our mind on human things, not on divine things. Thank goodness for Peter so clumsily maybe calling us out calling out the disciples then and passing the baton to us today that we might understand. Focus on things of faith, not on guarding yourself per se, but on the goodness that we are called to. The compassion that Jesus calls us to even today reaches out to our neighbor now, but also to generations that come after us as well as we were reached out to by generations that came before us. The saving of our life, friends, comes from the passing along of Jesus' love, godly love, for the building up of community in the now and the future. May we hold on to that truth this season of Lent. Amen. Let us enter now a time of prayer. 
And let us begin with a moment of silence that you may lift up your own joys and concerns before your God. Holy and gracious God, we lean into the Lenten journey. The cross of Jesus is before us. The cross of Jesus is with us. It is a reminder of how you turn humiliation, weakness, and death into hope and strength and resurrection. The cross is testimony that life and love are fierce and durable, and your creation moves forward towards redemption, even when all seems lost. Help us to take on ways and habits and practices that support our faith and our trust in you. Guide us with the Spirit and with those we share this journey with. Let your teachings be on all, be on all hearts, with the outline of grace clear for those who would dare to look. We pray again for this broken world for the broken institutions and the fallen leadership that deal in fear-mongering. We pray for the war-torn places around the globe where families are destroyed and culture is declined. We pray for the Ukraine, for the Middle East, for places we are hushed from list lifting, but that are known by you. We pray, O oh God, for the people who rest in the craters of bombs and for those whose hearts need to be changed. We pray for our congregation, our community, our friends, our family, those that we know, for those who feel far from home and those who feel the ache of change. We pray, O oh God, for those who are confronting, managing health concerns and life concerns. We pray for Bill and Ruth, as Bill is recovering from broken bones due to a series of recent falls. We pray with Gary for struggling issues from identity theft. We pray with Gary for his Aunt Alice and for co-worker Rachel. And our sympathy and prayers are extended to Loretta and to her sister Lillian for their passing, for their sister's passing, for Patricia's passing. We pray, O oh God, for their whole family and for all who remember with grace and love Patricia. And we join the Huffman family in prayers for uh, Janine's nephew's passing and for the ways in which his life touched other lives, even at the time of death. We pray, O oh God, your blessings of mercy and care may fall to each in their own need. For these whom we lifted aloud and those that are upon our hearts, even as we lament for the pain of our times, we trust your rising joy that meets us, and we recommit ourselves to follow the way of the cross, holding ourselves gently as we walk on your holy path. And so now, with the confidence as the children of God, we lift our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to say when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time in our worship to respond to all that God has offered us. This is our call to offering and discipline. This season of Lent, we are focusing this time of responding to God on our personal faith discipline practices. Our Lenten journey should be where we look within ourselves and make a commitment to grow in our relationship with God and to make learning more about Him a discipline practice that will carry us well past the Lenten season. 
You may remember Pastor Leanne's Transfiguration Sunday sermon, where she reminded us that all this, as it was for the disciples, can be somewhat scary and problematic because of the unknown. She shared that personal transformation, the ability to see God in Christ, is not achieved by trying, but by training. Bottom line, we have to do the work with patience and persistence. We have welcomed this morning our new members taking on membership vows, and it is our hope that they will continue their service and learning of what it is to be a United Methodist and a part of this congregation as part of their Lenten discipline. Some of you have made a commitment to learning and have been attending the after-service Lenten study, which is hopefully providing you with more tools to continue your quest for more knowledge, patience, and persistence. This Lenten season, unexpectedly, I've had to take on personal self-care and health as my work for this year. Many in this congregation have been and still are more ill than I, and we lift them in prayer every day, hopefully. The first hurdle, as many of you can attest, involved just getting out of bed in the morning as the need to sleep has been overpowering. Then it was, well, at least get up and get dressed. <laughs> and through all of this struggling with brain fog that I still have made concentration so difficult that even the simplest task seemed harder and more complicated than it should be. Patience and persistence. In the past couple weeks, it has been get up and do something as the urge to nothing continues. So I do some not too strenuous chores, one or two, and in the past couple weeks, I've started to exercise again and have also been able to eat more normally. Patience and persistence. This has been my way to overcome the tiredness and malaise, as well as praying often both day and night, praising God for regained strength and energy each step of the way. And for me, and probably for some of you, this process has seemed like it's taking an inordinate amount of time. But I'm learning it will take as long as it takes. And if I didn't have or I forgot what patience was before while I was teaching severely handicapped youth, I'm being reminded again now. Patience with persistence are important disciplines to have when training or retraining to do something more. And although this is not really the time nor the place, but our sermon kind of this morning touched on it, politics is not something we dwell on in this sacred space. But it is something that we need and should have more discussion about, using patience and persistence to do the hard work and providing grace for each other's beliefs. By working together and creating solutions for others, we often find answers to our own problems. Learning and understanding each other can help us build bridges to solutions. This too is an important part of our calling as God calls us as we carefully, honestly, and prayerfully consider what this election will truly mean for our country as we remember to mark our ballots. That was a commercial. <laughs> Patience and persistence. Another call for all of us is giving to the ministry of this church as we reach out to those around us. Giving is not about us and this church, or it's not all about us and this church, although it's very important as this is where we come to renew our strength and energy for the work that we should be doing all throughout the week, whether it's going to school, working at our various jobs, uh, including stay-at-home work, volunteering, greeting folks with a smile and a special good morning, or however it is we share our love for Christ through our actions within our homes, our community, and the worst of the world. Patience and persistence. For our giving, we have all the usual ways. The QR code, maybe, checks in the mail or through the mailbox set next to the office and also at the script table. And of course, during our last song, you are welcome to come and place your offering in the giving box. We continue to thank you for all that you do. Please join me now 
in our prayer of dedication for our offerings and our commitments to deepen our spiritual practices as we struggle to understand our God through the one that we call the Christ. Let's pray. God of boundless goodness, we have come to this place this day to worship you with our songs, with our words, with our gifts, and with our whole hearts. We are reminded that our discipleship decisions involves more than what we bring this day to the altar. It calls us to a place where a cross that is ours alone must be picked up and carried. This, more than anything else, is why we need the community of your church. Strengthen us, we pray, not just to carry our own cross, but to help sisters and brothers carry their crosses as well. In the name of the one who bore this cross for us, amen. Please stand as you are able and join in singing, Forth in Thy Name, O Lord. now into the world, assured and confident of God's great love for you, just as you are. Carry this out into the world to a world that is deeply in need of being seen and heard and loved. In Christ's name, amen.